and they built for Pharaoh store cities, a phantom and rat ramses. But the more they oppressed the Hebrew people, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread it abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread, meaning they were afraid of the people of, of Israel, and worked them as slaves and made them live bitterly with hard service and mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work and in the field. And all their work was ruthless, was ruthless, made them work as slaves. So in other words, Pharaoh had no relationship with God or with the, with the Israelite people. And he began to fear the Israelite people. A little background, Pharaoh, back when, before the, when the Hebrew people came into Egypt, they came under their father, Joseph. And the Pharaoh back then and Joseph had an agreement. And Pharaoh had a good relationship with Joseph. Pharaoh raised Joseph up into his, into his kingdom that he was the second in charge. And Joseph was able to bring his father and his brothers into Egypt out of the land of famine that was going on at that time. So that's how the Hebrew people got into Egypt. And they began to grow and they began to multiply. And the same Pharaoh of that time was not the Pharaoh here. He was afraid of God's people. So it stated in Exodus 1.17, but the, I'm sorry, Yet the more he tried to oppress God's people, the more they multiplied. And so Pharaoh came up with an idea to end the growth of the Hebrew people. Pharaoh was trying to stop God's people from growing. And he told the Hebrew midwives when they were assisting with the birth that if a boy was born to kill them and only let the girls live, right there, the enemy was trying to break down the family. It stated in Exodus 117, but the midwives, feared God and did not do as Pharaoh asked. Right. And so when Pharaoh commanded them to do it, and the male children were still living, he told the, the Pharaoh called the Hebrew women to him, and he said, what's going on? Why aren't you killing the male children? And the midwife said, by the time that we get to the Hebrew women, they've already given birth because they're vigorous. And they give birth before we come. They're not like the Egyptian women. Oh, come on. After this, the people became even more stronger. And because the midwives feared God, he then gave them their own families and blessed them with children of their own. So Pharaoh then told the people, when a Hebrew boy is born, throw them into the Nile River and let the girls live. The enemy was still trying to kill our children. He was after our children. He was trying to break down the family unit. And it was coming from the head of the country. So that brings us to our mother of faith, Moses' mother, Yoshebed. In verse 2 of chapter 2, it states, The woman bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Fine in this verse in the Hebrew word is told, T-O-V, which means good, beautiful, Fine, out of the ordinary, good to the eyes. We can find the same word in Genesis, in the first, first chapter of Genesis, where God was talking about creation. And when he said he made it and it was good and very good, it's that same kind of fine. So she had a fine child. When she looked at her child, she knew he was not an ordinary child. It was something special about her child. And we as mothers, we all do that when we look at our children, when we birth our children in the world, and we look down at our little ones, we see something special about them, something unique about our children, something out of the ordinary. So this mother here of faith saw something different about her child. She felt that God might use him. She sensed that God had a special plan for him. Just as God had promised in the Garden of Eden that he would bring forth that, bring forth that seed that would kill the enemy, she thought that this might be her child. She had a biblical view of her children as a gift from God. Psalms 127, 3 and 4, it says, Lo, children are the heritage or the blessing of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. We as mothers at birth look upon them with special tenderness, especially that first look. 
We remember them rolling around inside our bellies. We remember the nudges and the kicks. That's a special time between a mother and a child. Not that dad doesn't have any part of that, but it's a special time for us as mothers. And I remember when I delivered my first child, and I was in the recovery room. Back then, there was two rooms. Now, that you, when you deliver and recover, it's all in the same room. But there was a delivery room, and then they rolled me into the recovery room with this little baby. And I was only 21 years old. And he was crying, and I was crying. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to take care of this baby. And I know he was trying to figure out how is she going to take care of me. I had no idea how I was going to provide for him how we were going to make it. Yet God already had a plan in place. So in Hebrews 11, 23, by faith my child was born because I was a single mother. I was obedient to God to bring him into the world. I trusted God that God was going to make a way, even though my faith was only a 21-year-old faith. I trusted God that he was going to make it for that child. First of all, out of being obedient, then my faith walk began. Each day it became a little bit harder and harder because his father was nowhere around. His father was not there to help me and take, help me take care of this child. And it was up to me and my family to provide for him. So when we're not married and we have children, dad can walk away, but mom has to stay. He can go, we gotta name him. He don't have to stay, but we have to be there. And if a mother does walk away, she's deemed cruel or neglectful or that she doesn't love her child. And that's not fair, but I had to do what I had to do, as we as single mothers have to do. We hold on to what we know. God is going to make a way for our children. So here she is, seeing that she has a fine child. And in Hebrew 11, 23, it said, by faith Moses was born. So that means that they had a choice. But they, the parents, chose to bring him into the world. And they hid him for three months by his, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful, meaning divinely favored. And they were not afraid of the king's decree. His parents trusted God more than they feared man. They took courage, trust, confidence, and faith in Jehovah God. In Acts 5, Acts 5 and 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. In verses 3 and 4, we see in Exodus the importance of a mother's role in her children's life. Yoshebeth had to have a strong prayer life. She was going through, she was going up against the Pharaoh, the king, the man, the head man in charge, like Obama. She was going up against him. That's reason to pray for divine instruction and guidance. She, being from a Levite tribe, knew how God had blessed her forefathers, Noah and Abraham, Jacob and Joseph. That's why it's important for us to tell our children of our family's heritage. Tell them of how our family had come from a mighty long way. When, when we tell our children how God had blessed our grandparents to bring them from the south up to the north, where they was picking cotton, two dot two cent a pound, and they still had to take care of their children. And back then there weren't small families. My great-grandparents had 14 kids on two cent a pound of, of cotton. And how they were going to take care of them, provide a roof over their head, put clothes on their back, shoes on their feet. Boom, 14 kids eat a lot. And that doesn't include mom and dad that has to eat. But God made a way. He brought them up north. And up here, my grandfather was able to get a job at a plant. Now he was going from two cents a pound to maybe $2 an hour. That was a raise. That was a raise. He was able to take care of his small family, a wife and two children. But he was happy because God, he knew that God was going to make a way. So instead of working for someone else down in the cotton fields of Mississippi, now they were able to own their own homes. They were able to, to provide for their families. And our children could see that God's word is true. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or seed bed and bread. I re remember seeing my grandmother. Later on, my grandmother and my grandfather got a divorce. And my grandmother was the head of our family. She was the glue that kept us together. And yeah, my grandmother was out there. She kind of wanted to party and do all those things. But one thing I remember my grandmother did. She was a praying woman. Before she hit the floor in the morning,
morning. She grabs her Bible off the side of her bed and she will read Psalms 23. And we as little kids can hear her reading out loud. Then she'll flip over to Psalms 91 and start reading. Then she'll slide out the bed onto her knees and start praying. Praying for the children that were in her home because her daughters were still with her. All of her, her daughters were also single mothers. So her daughters and her, her grandchildren were in the home. She was praying, Lord, how am I going to help these girls take care of these kids? I remember hearing my grandmother pray, asking the Lord to provide a way for us to eat. Making sure we didn't know that the lights were getting ready to get turned off. We didn't know that the, that the gas man had come by to collect the, rent, the, collect the money and we didn't have it. We had no idea. But my grandmother knew it. She knew who to take it to. She knew that God would do it. So she had to fall pray to him and ask him to make a way for her. And he did every single time. I don't remember a day we did not live, we lived in our lives. I don't remember a day where we did not have clothes on our back. We may not have ate everything that we wanted to eat. Sometimes we had to have wish sandwiches, you know, two slices of bread. We wish something was in the middle. But God made a way. No one knew that we us all we had to eat. Our bellies was full. If we ate beans all week, nobody could tell. I remember a lady, my grandmother, telling me, put Vaseline on your lips. Wash your face, put Vaseline on your lips. Nobody know what you had to eat and going on to school. She provided a way. But she knew who to pray to. Yeah, she knew who to pray to. So when we were younger, before we were even, before we could read, we already knew Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still water. We knew that. We knew Psalms 91. We also knew the Lord is my shepherd, our Father who art in heaven. We knew that prayer. Before we could read it, we knew it because my grandmother instilled it in us. My mother and my grandmother, we call my grandmama Big Mama. We don't have too many of those nowadays. We called her Big Mama, and they were faithful because they knew how God had taken care of them. So Moses' mother knew she had to trust God because he was the only one who could protect her fine, favorite baby boy. They had two other children, Miriam, who was between the age of 6 and 12 years old, and Aaron, who was about 3 years old. And they watched their parents, Miriam and Aaron watched their parents provide for this baby because this baby was special. He had to be hit. The enemy was out to kill him. So the parents had to take care of him in a special way. And they had to hide him for 90 days. Now me being a mother of four and also working with small children, it's not easy to keep a, a three month old quiet. They cry, they whine, they're hungry. They wake up in the middle of the night. So mom had to do what she had to do to keep him quiet. Maybe she had to tie her to, a, to her bosom and she just walked around the house humming to him just so he would stay quiet. Or she had to put him in, put him in a basket and rock it while she took care of these other two. Because she had three kids at home and remember they were slaves. So then they were oppressed. It was hard times for them. But they had decided they would trust God over man. Miriam was there and she was watching her mother. We have to be careful because our, other, our children are watching us. Not only our children, other people's children. They're watching us. They need a role model. They need an example. They need someone to look up to. And we as women, we want to set the right example for these young ladies. So Miriam is watching her mother be a mother. And when Aaron was born, there was no need to keep him quiet. He was okay, he was safe, he was over the age. But Miriam sees the tears that her mother is shedding and crying as she's trusting in God as he protects her household. Yet the threat is still real, the Egyptians are still walking around. The enemy is lurking. He is, he is out to, for any opportunity to kill our family, kill our faith, kill our goals. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God, Jesus came that we might have life, and life more abundantly. It used to be a time when women and children were off limits. But now every time we turn on the TV, we hear about someone being hurt, a baby being shot, a woman going down. They were off limits at one time. Men used to handle it in a man's way. Now it's free game. The enemy is 
are lurking. Yes. We have to pray, church. Yes. We have to pray for our children. Yes. Before they are born, we have to start praying. Yes. Yet God has given us a commission to protect our children, teach our children, and to pray for our children. God heard Yoshebeth's prayer and saw her tears. Yes. Thank God he knows the end before the beginning. And at this point, it became too hard to hide him anymore, and she had to let him go. I can't even imagine mother making this basket, this little ark, with her tears from something she has to put her baby in to give him away. I'm sure that when she was preparing the basket, it was mixed with all types of mixed emotions, because at this point, there's nothing else that she can do. I can only imagine that she's putting this basket together and talking to her other children and to Moses how good Jehovah had been, how he had been good to their forefathers, how good he had been to the Hebrew children in the land of Egypt during their hard time of oppression and that she was going to make a way despite everything that they saw that he was going to make a way. So I asked my kids. When you get older, what do you think you're going to remember about what your mom and your dad has told you? What do you think you're going to remember? And, Kenan, without hesitation, I'm going to remember who said, I brought you in this world and I'll take you out. Don't count a bad for me. But then I had to really think about this thing. I had to think about it because the scripture in Proverbs 30, 13 and 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to, to discipline him. So in other words, because I love you, I have to correct you. Because I love you enough, I will discipline you so that the world won't have to. If, if, if I discipline you, it will keep you out of jail, keep you out of hell, keep you off drugs, keep you in school. To the store, I take them like to Target or something. Before we even got out the car, I would turn around and I start giving demands. Don't ask for nothing, don't look at nothing, don't touch nothing. If I want you to have something, I'll tell you to get it. Otherwise, no. The answer is no. And when we get in the store, if it was a kid cutting up in the store, all I had to do was get down the look. They would look at the kid like, stop. train our children. So I felt bad at first, but then I thought about it. We have to discipline our children. We have to correct our children. Because if we don't, the world will. They're waiting on them. They want the opportunity to try to turn them around. But God has given us as mothers a commission to train up our children in the way that they will go, that when they are old, they will not depart from it. They may stray a little bit, but they coming back because the word When I was younger, I watched my mother. I watched her as she battled. You, some of you heard her testimony of her, her battle with alcoholism. And I watched it all of my life. It was, not watch, it was not easy watching her suffer through all of the times that she was going through. Yet I remember when she came to herself, her testimony was how God had brought her out. It was her faith in God knowing that he, she couldn't give up because he continued to give her another day to get it right. How he took the taste of alcohol out of her mouth and replaced it with the thirst of his righteousness. I watched her as she trusted God more and more during her recovery pain. And then as she began to watch me as a young woman going through the things I had to go through, she would tell me, trust God, Trina. He will be there for you. If he can do it for me, he can also do it for you. I watched her. Who are our children watching? What are they seeing when they look at us as mothers? Are they seeing us praying for them? Are we teaching them the word of God? Are we instilling his values and morals over in them? Or are we out hanging with them? We at the nightclub with them. There are no more grandmamas. There's no more big mamas. There's nanas and missies and grandmamas. That's okay, though. 
That's okay, that's good. Yeah. But grandmothers was the root, was the glue of the family. Yeah. Yeah. That's what held the family together. Yeah. Granddad was good, he was okay. But yeah. grandma, yeah. when we needed something and mama wouldn't give us, we go to grandma. Yeah. Grandma would take care of it. She knew how to make it all right. I remember going to my big mama. And when my mom, would, I would be upset with my mom, I would just go and lay my head on my big mama's shoulder and on her lap. And she would just rub my head and say, Trina's going to be okay. Trust God. So we have to just remember who is watching us. Our children are watching us. Amen. I watched my mother, but I watched her recover. I watched God bring her through. That was the strength that I needed to know that I could also make it through. I can imagine Moses' mother as she's making that, that basket to put her baby in, to take him to the Nile River. I can imagine what she's saying to her children. Amen. Trust God, trust Jehovah. Remember, he is faithful. He will protect you. And I love you always. Can it come on? I'll do a little demonstration like that. So when we raise our children up and we're instilling God's morals and values in them, the most important thing is to give them the word of God. Proverbs 13 and 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent for it and to discipline him. Proverbs 22, 6 and 6 says, Train up a child that's a Camille, in the way that he will go, that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust God with all thy heart. Lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. Jeremiah 20, 29 and 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, for plans for welfare and not for, in, for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will, be call, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will know you. We want our children to know God for themselves. We can't, they can't trust God on their faith and what we know. They have to trust God on what they know. And the way to know that is to instill the word of God in them so that when they do go, when we have to let them go, go, go. <laughs> God 
God's provision for our families. In Titus 2, 3, and 4, it says, Guide older women into lives of reverence so that they can end up as neither gossipers nor drunks or models or goodness, but look at them, the younger women who will know how to love their husbands and children for be virtuous and pure and keeping a good home. So it's saying, older women, we have to be there for the younger women. Mothers, older mothers, we have to be there for the younger mothers, for the single mothers, for the mothers who are struggling. They need to hear our testimonies about Yeah. 
She heard that baby's crying and she knew that baby needed his mother. She ran up and asked Pharaoh's daughter, should I go and get someone to nurse him? God knew what was needed to be done at that particular time. God stepped right in. He was the one. He was going to use the very place that was trying to kill him to protect him. His mother's prayers kept her child. James 5 and 16b says, the prayers of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Can you imagine the joy in Miriam's heart as she heard this woman have a wonderful, was very excited about this baby. And now Moses' mother was called to come and take care of his child, this child, her child. Come to take care of her child. Yes. You didn't hear me. Come to take care of her child. Yes. The one that she had to give away. Right. The one she put into the river. And not only that, Pharaoh's daughter told her, I will pay you to take care of your child. Kids, she got three kids at home. They need shoes, they need clothes, they need food. Now God can make provision for them to take care of their children under the protection of Pharaoh's house. That is how God will work. He will work. He will work it. I remember when we didn't have any food in the house. My baby was real little and he needed diapers and my mom and I was trying to figure out how we were going to make a way. We was in between paychecks. I went down to the mailbox and there was a check in the mail. The check was enough for what that baby needed. We were able to make it to the next paycheck. Whew, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He is good. And if we walk by faith and not by sight, he will make a way. Jehoshaphat did not let her circumstances dictate her actions. She would have been submitted to fear had not she had her faith in God. She was a Hebrew slave destined for sorrow, but God turned that thing around so that her child was raised up in the king's house where he received the shelter, food, protection, provision, and the finest education. And because she was allowed to take care of him, she was also able to teach him about Jehovah God. God showed her once that he would take care of Moses so she could trust that God would take care of him again. Proverbs 1 and 8 said, Hear, my son, the father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. So in my closing, she was a wife, she was a mother, she was a friend, she was a wise woman that put her faith in Jehovah. We're only giving our children for a short time, and then they must develop a relationship with God for themselves. They can't depend on mama's faith or daddy's faith to get them through. We bring them to church to lay down the spiritual foundation in them. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord in all thy heart and lean not until thy own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. That scripture is not just for us, but it is also for everyone who believes and that includes our children. Women of God, mothers, we must know that God is complete control of our children's lives. We have to trust him with everything. Be a woman of faith and build a relationship with God. Because at some point, we all have to stand at the side of the Nile River and watch our children walk away. We have to see that God's timing is there, is in their lives just as it is in ours. She opened her mouth. Proverbs 31, 26 says, she opened her mouth to wise counsel and the teaching of her kindness is on her tongue. Proverbs 31, 28 says, her children will rise up and call her blessed and her husband also. He will praise her. We don't want the praises of man. We want the praises of God. We want the praises of God. We want to fulfill his for our life. And mothers, we can do it. I encourage you to always just pray over your children. Pray without ceasing. Talk to them about your history. Talk to them about how God had brought you through. It's nothing more fulfilling when your until your daughter comes to you and says, because you told me about your life, I know not to go down that road. I know, Mom, because you went through all of that and you were willing to share it with me. Now I know where to go. Thank you for the wisdom that you have imparted to me so that it will not go far. Oh, my God.